get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And Mark, you'll appreciate this. Past guests include founder uh, of Atari, Nolan Bushnell, and he was Steve Jobs' mentor. This is specifically relevant because we're gonna talk about mentor to millions. So he was Steve Jobs' mentor and he talked about on the podcast, Mark, about how he was offered 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no to that. Okay. Brian Kurtz was on the podcast, talks about over delivering his book, over deliver standing on the shoulders of giants in direct response and marketing. And no one gets at this alone, which Mark, I know is a message you preach over and over. Caleb O'Dowd and Sam Markowitz came on. They talked about being mentored by the late Gary Halbert and how it was like the most invaluable thing they could do and get. And so before I introduce today's amazing guest, Mark, this episode is brought to you by rise 25. Rise 25, I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And what we do is we help B2B businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 best relationships. You know, Mark, in both our lives, relationships are the number one thing in our lives. And we help them do that by helping them launch and run a podcast. Over the past decade um, that I've been podcasting, I have formed amazing relationships, business partnerships, friendships. We go on family vacations together. And I would never stop podcasting for those reasons. Obviously, it's led to business relationships, but those other things, it fuels those other things. So there's no better thing. If you have questions, you want to launch and run your own podcast the right way, um, go to rise25.com and check out more. And I want to introduce today's guest, um, Mark Tim. Mark Tim has been an entrepreneur for almost three decades. He's started more than a dozen companies. He's had six exits. He's spoken professionally. Mark, I don't know if most people know this about you. Maybe they do. You've spoken professionally for more than 25 years, giving thousands of speeches to millions of people around the globe. And Mark's most important role is CEO of the most valuable business in the world. And Mark knows what I'm going to say, is his family. His family, of six kids, his wife. And his own experience of dealing with entrepreneurial challenges fueled his passion for helping people balance. Uh, You know, it's hard to say that word, balance, entrepreneur balance, right? The demand of family life and actual business. And he co-authored the book, Mentor to Millions, Secrets of Success in Business, Relationships, and Beyond. And he co-authored it with Kevin Harrington. If you don't know Kevin Harrington, he's one of the original sharks of the hit TV show Shark Tank. He's taken 21 businesses to over $100 million. He's worked behind the scenes of business ventures, produced more than $5 billion in global sales, launched more than 500 products. And this is really just for the podcast. This isn't available anymore. You need to go to kevinmentor.com. If you go to kevinmentor.com, they are offering a 30-day mentorship. You need to show that you bought the book. I bought it on Audible. It's amazing. Check it out. And you can buy it on Amazon. You probably get it in the bookstore. They hit USA Today bestseller. Mark, I'm gonna stop talking and let you talk. But thanks for joining. Man, us. I, you don't you don't have to stop talking. You're on a roll. Like I was loving every. I'm picking up everything you're putting down <laughs> right now. So I'm fired up. I want everybody to go to Rise 25. I absolutely want to know why that dude turned down 33 <laughs> percent of Apple. And so you know, you talk about a hook. You know, I'm all in, man, and and I'm the guy that gets to sit here and talk to you about this stuff. So I'm fired up. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you for having me. And you know, it, what's the, here's the cool thing: the manuscript of this book was turned in almost a year ago, before COVID, before quarantine. And I'm here to tell you that uh, I know you know how valuable mentors are. You you seeded this whole podcast talking about some super amazing people that had mentors in their life. But right now, like right now, there's this amazing thing happening. Number one, never before have we needed mentors more in our life than we need them right now. But here's the catch, and this is the part that gets me so excited. Never before have more people been willing to help their common man, to help their common woman, to help their their neighbors, their colleagues, their 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 just the 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 person helping them at the grocery store, at the convenience store, at the gas station. We are have this mindset of just abundance. We want to help each other 
through these crazy times. And so, so we need mentors more than ever, but I think there are more mentors on the sidelines ready to say, put me in the game, coach, I'm ready, than there's ever been before, which is super exciting for me. Mark, you know, I know you just came out with this book and everyone should get it. I want the sequel. I want the next one already. I want the next one of like mentors, you know, the giants out there and who mentored them. Yeah. So I want the sequel of this one, but I mean, everyone needs to check this out. But I want to start with this for a second. My favorite story from the book. Okay. This is my, my favorite story. There's, there's many great stories, but my favorite story is towards the end and your kids are up on stage. Okay. Wow. And wow. but, you're gonna make me emotional here already. I mean, you're what? you're like just going for it right out of the gate. Why wait? You know, but um, you know, I want to hear about the before. So they started off about the before you were start you focused yeah. on family and treating family yeah. life as seriously as you did your business. Talk about what they were saying, what they started off saying, and you can <laughs> give people context to this, but that is everyone should get the book just for just read this one story. I mean, yeah. What they saying? It, uh, so Tom Ziegler, Tom Ziegler, the son of Zig Ziegler. I mean, this guy is an amazing human being. He's a friend. He wrote the forward to the book. And when he finished reading the book, number one, he was in tears. And he said, I've read thousands of books. And he said, I've never read an epilogue. He said, in fact, Mark, you've, you've titled the epilogue incorrectly. He said, it's an epic log. Mm. And, you know, and so to give everybody context, here's the scene. Okay. So I, I make this decision to start running my family as uh, my most valuable business. I made the decision to give my family the first and my best. And the reason I say I made that decision was because I was getting it wrong for a long time. And I wasn't treating them first and giving them uh, the, my best. I was giving them my last and my least, if you want to know the truth. And I wasn't delivering what they needed. I wasn't the father. I wasn't the husband that I was put on this earth to be. So I'm in Hungary. And this is last year, actually. And I'm the keynote speaker at the Marketing Academy. And I speak for three days. Like I'm teaching these first generation entrepreneurs how to be entrepreneurs. But I brought my kids with me because if they're my most valuable business, then they need to be with me, right? So my kids are with me. I got three of the six are with me. And, and all, all week, they're seeing me with these kids. And so the last day of the conference, the organizer comes up and says, hey, you're supposed to get up on stage and give an hour-long presentation about your family being your most valuable business. But uh, everybody's like talking about your kids being here. And, and the buzz is, is like, we want to hear from them. So how about I call them up on stage instead of you? And before I knew it, like it was happening and my kids are all giving me the cutthroat sign. No way. I'm not going on. No chance, dad. It's not happening. My daughter looks at me and says, you drag me up on stage. I'm not saying anything. And so, and I'm like, I'm like, it's okay. I said, just, just go along with it. My son was there and he said, I'll say something. I'll speak. Yeah. And your son has been on business trips with you. So he's yeah, absolutely. around you. Absolutely. So, so he says, he knows the drill and he's like, I'll talk for everybody. And my daughter's like, okay, fine. We don't have to say anything. We'll go up on stage. So like this literally happens in a span of minutes. I can't prep them anything. And they call them up on stage and it's the three of them. And I'm standing there just completely exposed. And the guy says, I just have one question for you. What was it like to grow up the child of an entrepreneur? Well, like what, did you, getting, what did you think they were going to say at that point? I didn't have any clue because my daughter said they didn't want to talk at all. <laughs> and, you know, and I had no time to prep them. I knew what I wanted them to say, but I had no control. It was like one of those moments where I just had no control over the situation. I had no idea what they were going to say. So my son gives the kind of correct answer and, you know, and it's just kind of what, what you would expect him maybe to say because he traveled with me a lot. So then he finishes and they pass the mic and I'm like, oh no, they're, they're not going to talk. And my, my middle daughter, so she grabs the mic and she passes it down to my youngest daughter. She's like, okay, I'll just pass this sucker down. I'm done. And so my youngest daughter sits there and it's like this painful silence, just nothing. And all of a sudden she starts speaking and her voice is shaking. 
she's like shaking because she's so afraid. You see, there's 400 people here, by the way. Let's put it in context. It's not like there's four people. There's 400 people. And she said, I hated my dad being an entrepreneur. I hated that he missed everything, that he wasn't there. I hated that he traveled all the time. I didn't, I didn't care what he did because I didn't like whatever it was he was doing. And, you know, I, I, I was mad at, at him being an entrepreneur. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm like, oh, how is this going to end? And then she said, but about five, six years ago, my dad made a decision to make us his most valuable business. And it changed everything. It changed my life forever. It changed our family's life forever. And I can tell you that I don't want my dad doing anything else but being an entrepreneur. And I'm so thankful. I'm getting teary. I just telling you the story, but I don't want my dad doing anything but doing what he's doing. And I'm so thankful that he's an entrepreneur. And I'm so thankful that he's our father. And I'm so thankful that he figured out his most valuable business. And I'm telling you, I turned around and 400 Hungarians, there wasn't a dry eye in that entire room. They were people on the floor. There were people consoling other people that were outwardly sobbing. And later I asked the organizer, you know, why were they so emotionally, you know, taken by this experience? And it's because there was a room full of first generation entrepreneurs. Jeremy, they were they were, they were moms out there that it's the first thing they've done outside of caring for their kids. And the only thing that they want is at some point in their life for their children to say, I'm so thankful that my mom or dad is an entrepreneur. I don't want them doing anything else but that. And so they were crying, not because of me and not because of grace. They were crying because that's what they most want in their deepest desires of their heart is for their family to say that exact same thing and then of course my middle sis daughter she got the microphone and she talked about how she left school her freshman year you know how critical your freshman year is right she literally left high school for an entire year to travel with me for a year and we went on over 30 trips together her and i she traveled as my personal assistant and she just added to the, the tear fest that was going on there. But it was, it was, without a doubt, one of the top five moments of my entire life was at that moment where I had no control of what was happening. And it was because, you know, the book starts out with this driveway moment where I'm sitting at my driveway and I don't want to go home. And the reason I don't want to go home is because I just had one of the best days of my life in business. I had the biggest sale in my life. I made every decision with confidence and I knew I was going home to a situation of chaos and confusion and I didn't want the euphoria to end. But it was at that moment that I said, I've got everything screwed up. I've got my whole life upside down. That what if, what if the most valuable business I will ever own, ever operate, ever even be a part of was the one I was going home to, not the one I went to that day. And that's when everything changed for me. And I started treating business like practice, like everything I did in business was practice so that I could get it perfect at home. And my business did become my most valuable business. I legally incorporated my business, Jeremy. I, I, you can look up the 2B Tim's LLC is a legal entity. That's how far I went to make sure that I got this right. And Hungary was the ultimate you know, test of, of whether or not this experiment mattered. And I can tell you now, my kids are young adults and their life was forever changed because of that one decision at the end of my driveway. You know, Mark, there's another cool moment of the book when you talk about naming that company. Yeah, so, uh, you know, so I, I'm gonna, uh, there's two parts to that story. So the name of the company is 2B, letter B, Tim's LLC. But we, we named it 2B Tim's LLC because we wanted... The, the family business to be about what's it mean to be a Tim? What, is, what does it mean to be a Tim? And what about being a Tim, right? And, and what's the enterprise value? And we, we created a logo and a mission statement and, and all the stuff that you do in business, we did that. But here's what happened. 
is that at one point there was an executive session called the family business, not by my wife or I, but by the kids. And the reason it was called was because my wife and I are a blended family. And there were three kids in our family that I love like my own son and daughter, even though they're not my biological children. But they bought into this family business. They were sold out on the family business. They absolutely were all in, but there was a problem. And the problem was that if they were equal shareholders, because they own the same amount of shares as mom and dad, but the difference is, is that their mom's last name was Tim and theirs wasn't. And they held an executive session and said, if we're going to own equal shares of this family business, then we better get this right. And we need our last names to be Tim. Wow. And the part of the story that I didn't tell you know, earlier was that the young lady, my daughter, who traveled with me for a year is not my biological daughter. She is my wife's daughter. We're the modern day Brady Bunch, three boys and three girls. And so, so that daughter, what we were able to achieve traveling together in, in Ubers and, and on airplanes and the relationship that we built, like I, I just went out to see her. She's in uh, all the way on the West Coast in college. And I just went out for the weekend just to spend time with her. And so, so what happened was, is that that completed the merger. Like we were a blended family before that moment. After that moment, we were a corporate merger. Like we brought two businesses together and right. they became one. And, and from that point forward, we were officially 2B Tim's. And it's just a beautiful thing. It was the, and, and the cool thing is, is that this family business was not his, not hers, not theirs, not ours. But every single member of the family had equal voice, equal vote, equal shares. And it was, it just brought us together in such an incredible way. And so if you're out there listening and you can relate to any of this, you know, maybe, maybe you need to make your family your most valuable business and, and treat everything else you do outside of it like practice so that you can really get it right when it matters, because I'm going to tell you something where we were at prior to that decision was not pretty. I can only share this with you because we got it wrong. I got it wrong for a long time before I got it right. In fact, I got it wrong for longer than I've gotten it right, but I got it right just in time. And it's made all the difference in my marriage, in my family and in my relationships. Yeah. Mark, I want to talk about mentors and I want to talk about Zig Ziglar, Kevin Harrington. Before I do, I want to stick on this topic for a little bit just to, you know, give someone next steps. You know, someone's out there, if any of these entrepreneurs out there, they can relate to your story on some level. I don't care who you are and I can. And how do you start, what should people start to do to run their family as serious as their business? Yeah. So uh, basically I'll take the pressure off. If you're good at anything, I don't care if you're an entrepreneur or you work for someone else. If you're good at your work, you can be that good at home. You just have to take what you're good at and start doing it at home. I can't function in my work without meetings. I'm really good at them. I'm efficient. I have agendas. I get stuff done. Yet prior to making my family a business, I had not had an intentional meeting with my family ever. Like mm. we sat down at dinner. What, what are you doing tomorrow? What are you doing next week? Whatever. That's not a family meeting. I mean, what's the purpose of our family? Why were we put together? What are we supposed to accomplish? You know, what's our mission statement? What's our values? What, what's our enterprise value? What's our reputation? What, what do we need to learn? How can we be better as a family? Those are the kind of things we started talking about in our family meeting. So every Sunday night, we had a family meeting. Every Sunday night, we, every Monday, I had business meetings. Like every Monday, my businesses all met and talked about what we were going to accomplish that week and what we, we, what, why we existed as a business. We started doing that. I'm good at marketing. All of my businesses have logos. They have mission statements. So we did logos and mission statements. At one point, okay, get this. I used the same logo crowdsourcing for my family that I did my business. We had... For my business, I got 97 logos for my business when I used this crowdsourcing, okay? 97 logos. For my family, I got 185 logo submissions for my family. Twice as many for my family as I did for my business. 
it was such an epic adventure to create a logo for our family. And you know what it cost me? 99 bucks, $99. And I got 185 submissions for my family because I think these designers around the world were just like, this is so cool. I went in on this. And so, you know, so my point is, is that family meetings are a logical place to start, you know, because they just, they kind of became the hub for us. And, and, and by the way, one of the gifts that I'll give, if you go to kevinmentor.com, I will give you my family meeting guide. So I actually have a family meeting guide. It's one of the gifts that we'll give if you go to kevinmentor.com, if you want to know how to run an effective family meeting. And I have two versions, one for little kids, one for teenagers, because people ask me all the time, they're like, yeah, but my kids are older. I didn't start doing this until my oldest was 15. Okay, so it's not like I started when they were five you know, is 15 years old. So, you know, so we were, we were a little late, you know, on the curve of this, but, but it's better late than ever. The, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The right. second best time is today. And so, you know, so get started today. So the bottom line is, is that you can do this. If you're good at anything, you can be that good at, at, at your family. You just got to connect them. You've got to integrate them. Okay. I, we talk and we teased about balance. The truth is, is that family work-life balance is actually a myth. It's like a holy grail. The true balance that we want to achieve is integration. It's work-life integration. Integrate your work and your life. And by the way, COVID and quarantine has forced us to integrate that a lot more. And so why not do it on purpose? Why not be intentional about it instead of just being forced into it? Yeah. I mean, listen, it's crazy, Mark. Like, I don't know if people have a hesitation in getting, like spending $20 for someone's life's work in pages, right? But just to add, add to it, kevinmentor.com, you know, you can get actually how to run the meeting and kind of going from family to mentors. Um, you have, I think it's turtles around your house and yeah, talk about significance. Uh, 40, <laughs> over 40 turtles, over 40 turtles in my house, not live turtles, but like, like, <laughs> you know, like statues and little, you know, stuff and everything like that. And so, you know, so the, con by the way, it's not even $20. Amazon has our book on sale for 10% off. So it's like, it's like $18. And if you have a prime account, it's free shipping. So that's, that's how no easy excuse. Thing exactly. Get. Okay. So turtles. All right. The reason we have turtles all over our house, like you can't go to a single room in our house without seeing a turtle. And the reason is, is because one time a mentor, of mine told me a story about a turtle on a fence post. And I'm thinking a turtle on a fence post, like no turtle can get on a fence post. What in the world is a turtle doing on a fence post? And he said, that's the point. If you ever see a turtle on a fence post, there's only one thing you know for absolute certain, that turtle did not get there by himself. And the concept is so powerful because so many times we find ourselves on a fence post. Maybe we got to, maybe we won an award. Maybe we, maybe we were fortunate enough to get a promotion. Maybe we got a raise. Maybe something good happened to us. That is the equivalent of being on a fence post. Well, guess what? You didn't get there by yourself. Okay. You had, you had encouragers. You had supporters. You had people who believed in you. You had mentors that got you there. So we had these turtles all over our house because we wanted our kids to make sure that every time something good happened in their life, we wanted them to remember how they get there, okay? Now, I will tell you, if you're listening to this, there's the reverse of this as well, and we talk about it in the book, and the, the reverse is, is that when our kids did something wrong, that was a different kind of fence post, but it was a fence post all the same. Do you know, almost without exception, Anytime our kids made a bad decision, there was somebody else that contributed to that bad decision, either gave them bad advice, were there, encouraged them, and them to do the wrong thing, you know, or didn't stop them from doing the wrong thing. So when it came time to talk about why something shouldn't be done, we often talked about the turtle example as well. You didn't get there by yourself. Who were the people that put you on that bad fence post? as much as being on the good fence post. And by the way, in our family, the turtle example was played out like this. My wife and I were soccer coaches. We coached uh, our kids' soccer teams. We realized early on that if someone scored a goal, they got a lot of glory. 
but we always in practice, it was about the past, the past, the past, the past, the past. It wasn't about the goal. It was about the past. So we decided that other teams, when someone would score a goal, the person who scored the goal got all these high fives. So on our team, if someone scored a goal, the person who passed the ball hmm. to the person who scored the goal got all the high fives. Love because it. the person who scored the goal got the glory of the goal. They did not need the high fives. But the person who passed them the ball got – they got to – in fact, on our team, you, the person who passed them the ball got to run down the sideline and got high fives by everybody. But the person who scored the goal stayed on the field, okay? So in our family, during family meetings, you were rewarded for finding something that one of your siblings did during the week – that was a fence post moment. Not the person who was on the fence post, but the person who noticed them being on the fence post. So that was equivalent of passing the ball. So you got more accolades and more kudos by noticing your brother or sister doing something special than your brother or sister who did the special thing. And what that did is it taught our kids to look for good in others, to be abundant in their thinking, that it was more joyful to give than to receive. That, that Zig Ziglar, as we talked about, his famous quote that I, I live my life by, you can have everything in life you want if you'll just help other people get what they want. And, and that's really, that's the definition of abundance versus scarcity. We want our kids to live that life, not look at me, look how awesome I am. We want them to find other people and help other people accomplish their dreams. And then it will come back to them a hundredfold. You know, Mark, I want to talk about Zig Ziglar because Zig Ziglar ultimately left to, you know, you know, led to Kevin Harrington. I remember listening to his audio cassettes in my car over <laughs> and over and over. And that Southern drawl, the quote that you just said, playing in my mind. And, and there's not a week that goes by that I don't think about that or say that out loud. So um, how did you discover Zig Ziglar? So I, you know, you, you talked about in the, in the early, um, in the, the intro to me, uh, a motivational speaker. So I, I spoke on a lot of stages as a young man, I was a very gifted uh, public speaker. And I spoke on the same stage as Zig Ziglar when I was 19 years old. Wow. And he came up to me in that Southern draw and he put his arm around me and I'm not even going to pretend to, to, to emulate it because I can't, <laughs> but he basically said, you know, Mark, I want you to come be my personal guest at my born to win seminar on my dime in Dallas, Texas. And I want you to stay with me and I want to mentor you. And I took him up on it. He was my first mentor. Like I had my grandparents, my parents, I realized now they were mentoring me, but yeah. the first person that actually said the word mentor. Yeah. And so, so I went down to Dallas, Texas. Why did he I, say that, Mark? What, what made him do that, you think, that day? I, I, know, I know what made him do it. It's the same thing that made him sit down and write a five-page handwritten letter to a prisoner on death row that, that could never buy his books, could never buy his audio cassettes. It's the same reason that he would stand in the back of a room after a speech and sign his books for five hours until he literally passed out. You have to understand that Zig Ziglar impacted 250 million people while he was alive. There was no Facebook, no Instagram, no podcast, no digital anything. He did it one person at a time, one speech at a time, one event at a time. And he did it by simply living out that quote. He was willing to help people regardless of the cost. And it came back to him a hundredfold, a thousandfold. Why did he pick me? I don't know. You know, why did he choose to put his arm around me? Uh, I just, I believe I was just so blessed to be in the right place at the right time. But I can tell you that my life was forever changed because of that, that, uh, that I, I'm only on this, this podcast right now because of, of that early mentorship by Zig Ziglar. And the coolest thing is, is that I didn't know Kevin Harrington. I'm, I'm, a, I'm just sitting at home loving Shark Tank. I mean, it was one of the things that me and the kids had in common. The kids love Shark Tank. I love Shark Tank. And, and my kids love Kevin Harrington. Like he was their favorite shark. He was on the first, uh, you know, few seasons. He was their favorite shark. And so, so they're like talking about Kevin Harrington and dad, you should meet him. You should know him. I'm like, I don't know Kevin Harrington. I don't even know how to get to <laughs> Kevin Harrington. And so, but lo and behold, my mentor's children, Tom Ziegler, Julie Ziegler, Cindy Ziegler, 
they were in conversations with Kevin Harrington because Kevin Harrington to help the Ziegler family continue their dad's legacy. I wanted to help the Ziegler family. And so the, the family was like, look, we got this great guy, Kevin Harrington. We got this great guy, Mark Tim. We should introduce them. And so our mentor that's, that passed this earth isn't even alive. Our mentor, Zig Ziegler, was impacting us in such a meaningful way through his children. And that's why this book that we're talking about, Mentor to Millions, it needs to be said right now. Millions has nothing to do with money. This is not a book about money. This is a book about impact. And if you want to impact the world, if you have a product, a purpose, or a passion that the world needs, the fastest way and the biggest way to get this to the world is through mentorship. And Zig Ziglar is the best example because I would never have met Kevin Harrington if it wasn't for my mentor, Zig Ziglar. So even in his death, past his time on this earth, his mentorship legacy is living on. It's rippling you know, through hundreds of millions of more people. And so, so Kevin Harrington and I get together and we know the secrets of Steve Jobs. We know the secrets of Warren Buffett. We know the secrets of, of all of these uber successful people that we all say, wow, what would it be like to be them? Well, guess what? The secret is they all had mentors. They all had mentors in their life. They had people who breathed into them wisdom when they needed it most. And, and when they were at their most vulnerable point of their life, they were there to help them. Maybe when they were failing, they were there to pull them back up. When they were succeeding, they were there to hold them you know, back on planet Earth. But they were there in their lives. And so the reason we wrote this book is because we want everybody to know. Do you know that over 50% of all people listening to this do not have mentors? Do not have mentors. There are fewer people walking on planet Earth that have mentors than there are that do. Hmm. And so, you know, so the fact is, is that that's got to change. If, if we're going to rise up, if we're going to be the best versions of ourselves, we have to have mentors. That's how people get super successful is they have people accelerating their, you know, uniqueness, their unique abilities. And those people are called mentors. You know, if the extent of trying to carry the legacy on in the book, we talk, you talk about finding trying to find a company to have a hologram of Zig Ziglar. Yeah. If people do doubt that mission, they need to listen to that part of the book because that is the ultimate, okay, we want to bring this person back. But um, talk about yeah. Kevin Harrington. So you meet Kevin yeah. Harrington. Your biggest takeaways from the mentorship, even before biggest takeaways, there's one piece of being introduced and there's another piece of actually becoming mentor, mentee. Yeah. So, you know, Kevin is probably, he's the busiest person that I know. Like, I'm sure there are people busier, you know, but I don't know anybody on this earth that's busier than Kevin Harrington. I mean, he's, he's involved in 50 different companies. He's had 700 different ventures in his lifetime. He's the inventor of the infomercial. He's got more deal flow coming in than you can imagine. So why in the world would this guy take time to mentor me? And so, and people ask me that all the time. How did you get a shark from Shark Tank to mentor you? Well, the first thing I did was, it wasn't my first mentor, by the way. So you don't, your first mentor probably shouldn't be a shark from Shark Tank. You should probably work yourself up. And so, so I'd had other mentors. So I knew how to get the most out of a mentor relationship. And so I said, Kevin, I want you to mentor me. I, I want to learn how to scale. I, I, what I most wanted from him was how to scale businesses. Because I had some successful businesses, but never scaled like he did. And so I said, here's the deal. I... I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to respect your time. You're crazy busy. I'm going to value your time. I'm going to make this easy for you. This will not be hard for you. And here's the catch. I will become your best student. There will be no better student you've ever had than me. And that was what got him to say, I'm in, I'll be your mentor. Okay, because he never had anyone give him that pitch. The man has heard over 50,000 pitches, <laughs> and I pitched him, and, and I pitched him the right way, and he said yes. And so, you know, so he becomes my mentor. Well, I had to become his best student. Like, I had to actually pay attention because guess what? He's so busy that he had no, almost no time for me. So I literally started traveling with him. I started traveling and helping him with some of the stuff he was doing. And so, and it was, it was again in, in airplanes and in 
uh, Ubers and, and, and at hotels and dinners that I learned, watching him on stage, watching him interact with people, it was caught more than it was taught. And then I could follow up and ask him, well, here's what happened. I become his best student. All of a sudden he's got time for me. Like he finds time for me because every mentor wants to spend time with their best student because he's seeing me change. And by the way, I'm starting to impact him. Every time I show up, I've got one of my kids. And he's like, what the heck? You're always bringing one of your kids. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, man, my, my, my kids are my most valuable business. I got to bring them with me. He's like, that's so cool. And so, so he started looking at his own family differently and his own children differently. And so, you know, so I'm impacting him. And so we start to like each other. We start to know each other. We start to trust each other. We end up going into business together. Okay. And so, you know, but in that journey, I learned a couple things from him. And one of the biggest things I learned, and people ask me all the time, you know, I want to start a business. What, what business should I start? And I'm like, okay, this is the lesson I learned from Kevin Harrington. In the chapter, we call it aggressive curiosity. It's one of the earliest chapters. But the reality of it is, is follow the eyeballs. Where are people looking? Where are people looking? And so like right now, a great place to start a business is an e-commerce because people are shopping online. That's where their eyeballs are. And then after that, it's like, well, what habits are people forming that are new? Well, one of the habits people are forming is, is that they still have aches and pains and hurts and harms. They just don't want to go to the doctor. So they're self-treating themselves for muscle cramps or arthritis. And so one of our businesses is just blowing up bigger than we can imagine. And it's in e-commerce around helping people with their bumps and bruises and, and aches and pains without going to the doctor. So if you're out there wanting to start a business, where are the eyeballs? Because you can have a great business over here, but if nobody's looking at it, it's not going to succeed. But you can have a good business or an okay business where people are looking and it's going to succeed. Because that's the difference between where are people looking versus where are they not looking. Like right now during quarantine, the last place I would have set up a business is a bricks and mortar business where people had to walk into the store. I could have the best store that's ever been created, but if nobody's walking in the door, I'm in trouble. And so I would rather have an okay business where everybody's at. So aggressive curiosity, follow the eyeballs, big lesson for me. Second thing was dream team. So guess what, Jeremy? I, whenever I was growing my businesses, I, I can tell you why I never scaled. And it's because I always hired who I could afford. Think about that for a second. Me and 99.99% of all people in business hire who we can afford. Kevin never hired who he could afford. He hired who was needed to take him to where he wanted to go. And he figured out a way to do that. And he said, Mark, I would rather have 10% of a CFO that could take me to $100 million, 10% of his time, than 100% of a CFO that was never gonna get me past a million dollars. Because that CFO, that million dollar CFO, they could work 100 hours a week and never get me past a million dollars. But that $100 million CFO, even working six to eight hours a week, could take me to $100 million. That's a dream team. That's putting a dream team in place that can take you where you want to go instead of what you can afford. If you put the dream team in place, you'll afford that dream team because they'll take you to the point you can afford them. <clears throat> so I started when I went, and then when I implemented this, I am, I can tell you today, I am well on my way to my first $100 million business. And it's because I set up a business in the path of the eyeballs around habits that people were forming. And I have a dream team in place. I'm only on this podcast because that dream team is running that business and I trust them to be running that business. And they are the dream team that's going to take it to a hundred million dollars. They are not the team that would have stalled out like all my other businesses. So I implemented what I learned from him and I'm now seeing the fruits of that implementation. So those are two things I learned and it's not just things I learned. It's things I'm implementing. I'm acting on, I'm being his best student. And now I'm seeing the rewards of having the right mentor. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Mark. Um, and there's an amazing portion of the book, Mentor to Millions, where Kevin Harrington, you are on a plane, so people should listen to that part, because that's really aggressive curiosity at its finest. So you have to listen to that part of the book to, 
to know what I'm talking I, about. But I just I, I gotta go ahead and just tell I'll tell the snippet. <laughs> I, I want you to get the book anyway, but it was like it was one of the few times in my life I thought I was on Canon camera. <laughs> And so I, it was, it was the first like long plane trip. I went on with Kevin and we show up at the airport together and I moved my family down to St. Petersburg so I could travel from the same airport as him. And, and I'm in Indiana, so it wasn't bad to move him down to Florida during the cold season. So it, it was fine. I had, I had buy-in from the, it was a unanimous vote at the family meeting. Let's I would vote way. for that for sure. Yeah. And yeah. so we're on a three hour flight from Tampa to Toronto and he shows up with this bag that's got his laptop in it. I recognized it. And another bag that I'd never seen. And it was like bursting full. It was like packed full. And he puts them both up above. And when, they, when the dinger goes off and we can get up and get our bags, he gets up and he doesn't get his laptop down. I get my laptop down. I'm like, Wi-Fi, got to do emails and stuff. He gets this other bag down and he opens it up and he starts pulling out newspapers and trade journals and articles. And he's, he's ripping articles out, and putting them in a manila folder. And then he's throwing the the discarded papers and magazines in front of him. Like he's just throwing them in front of him because he's just ripping through them and just chewing through the content. Aggressive curiosity at its finest. And all of a sudden, there's like a pile that's, that's all the way up to his knees. It's like way high. And I'm like, I'm like watching this going, what is going on? I don't even want to bother him because he's like <laughs> a machine, you know? And then almost like in cue, as I'm thinking, what's he going to do with all that stuff in front of him? The stewardess shows up with a, a empty trash bag and fills it all full of all of that newspapers and magazines. And he never even looked up like, like if she was in on the gig, like I'm the only person here that doesn't know what's going on. And she takes it all away. And then he keeps going and he does it again. And he like piles up this huge pile and she shows up again and she takes it all away. And when he's done, he's got this little folder full of the main content of all of that. And then I just couldn't help myself. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? And he's like, look, he said, if you're going to be successful in business, you've got to follow the eyeballs. You have to know what people are looking at. What are they reading? What are they looking at? And he, by the way, was more interested in the advertisements. He was more interested because if he could see multiple advertisements, what are people spending money on? What products are out there? And he recognized if it was a hot product and he saw it in multiple trade journals, but it wasn't in e-commerce, he would follow up with them and see if they needed a commerce partner to take them into his, his lane of business. And so, and he would send that stuff on to his son, Brian. And so anyway, it was just this amazing example. Do you know that super successful people read at least three hours a day? I mean, Warren Buffett is like five or six hours a day. Bill Gates is, is multiple hours a day. Zig Ziglar, three hours every single day. Kevin Harrington subscribes to five newspapers, five newspapers, okay? Trade journals, magazines, because he's consuming this content because he's aggressively curious about where the world is looking and what they are buying. Mark, you know, thanks for sharing that, by the way. I was going to make people read the book, but that's fine. There's, now, there, good, there's, there's so many stories like that, by yeah, the way. There, that's like one of a hundred. Yeah. And so if you like that story, you got to get the book because it's loaded with them. You know, you ran a successful manufacturing, e-commerce company, many other companies. I'm wondering from the, and it was a musical gifts, musical yep. gi or gift box, right? Um, so talk about from that company, maybe one big lesson on the front of, um, success and maybe one big lesson on the challenge front. Yeah. So uh, the success side of it was, is that we became the largest supplier of music boxes. When I mean music boxes, like you lift them up and they go ding, 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 you know, to play mm -hmm. music. At one point we were selling over a million of those a year. Wow. And, and, and what the reason it was so successful is because you could change out the face paper of the music box. So you would give it to your mom and it said, mom, you're so amazing. But then mom would take it and put a photo of her kids in it. And it went from being a gift to an heirloom. And so we, we took a lot of risk off of the retailer. We took a risk off of the consumer because ultimately anyone could personalize and customize it. If they had an iPhone or a camera, they could turn it into a personalized gift. And so that was the success side. The failure side was we were so successful that our local bank came along and said, you know, you could be more successful if you just had more money. And at the time we were a debt-free company. 
And I'm like, well, what do you mean more money? And they're like, well, we see your business. We see how much money you're making. We'll give you a million dollars. A million dollars will give you a line of credit. I'm like, well, a million dollars. I could be a billion dollar company, man, if I had a million dollars, right? So they give me a million dollars. And instead of staying true to our music box, we started coming up with all kinds of other products. Well, they weren't products that, that solved the problem. They weren't products that solved the problem of the retailer and solved the problem of the consumer. They were just me too products. Next thing you know, I wake up, that million dollar line of credit is now a million dollars of debt. So I went from a debt free company to in debt a million dollars. And frankly, I almost lost the business. And it was, I had to get back to the core focus of solving problems, solving problems of retailers, solving problems of consumers. And thankfully, I was able to get that company out of debt. And I ended up even exiting that company for a very nice multiple as a result. But I learned some valuable lessons uh, through of success and also failure inside of that company. And I, I go into much more detail inside the book, but that's one of the, that's one of the big case studies. We, we have a chapter in the book called Failure to Phoenix. Yeah. A phoenix is a mythical bird that only gets stronger if the previous version of itself dies. <laughs> and so in an entrepreneurial world, that means our idea fails. We would only get stronger when we fail. Zig Ziglar used to say, nobody drowns from falling in water. They drown from staying in water. And so that's, that's why people drown. So you got to get up, dust yourself off. And that's what mentors do. They, do. they help you get up. They help you learn what you've you know, why you failed and, and, and learn lessons from it so that you can be stronger and a better version of yourself. Kevin Harrington failed more than anybody I've ever met in my life. 700 different products. We, we celebrate that 21 of them made it to $100 million. But what happened to the other, you know, 679 of them? Okay. So you, you, he failed a lot on his way to massive success. Mark, first of all, I want to thank you. I have one last question. But I want to point people towards KevinMentor.com, right? Where else can we point people to check out the book, Mentor to Millions? Uh, Amazon is probably the best place. I mean, I, I have to tell you, our sales have been so extraordinary. The reviews, you mentioned it. We're, we're a USA Today best-selling book. We find out about Wall Street Journal uh, very soon. And so um, thousands, of, thousands of these books have already been bought. So go to Amazon. They still have it in stock. Um, that's probably the best place, but you can, you can find them on Barnes and Noble. You can find them at books a million, anywhere books are bought. Then go back to kevinmentor.com, show us you bought it. And then we'll give you the mentorship for free. Um, we'll give you, I'll give you the family meeting guide, um, you know, for free. We'll, we'll, whatever it takes for you to be able to implement what we're talking about in the book. The book's not a how to, it's not a step-by-step. -step. The book is a story of an entrepreneur and his mentor and our journey through our relationship and the lessons we learn in that process of, of family, of business, and relationships. So if you'd like to have more success in business, family, or relationships, then this is absolutely the book for you. Yeah, definitely. KevinMentor.com. Last question, Mark. And I figure this is, you know, kind of full circle. Um, your favorite Zig Ziglar story <laughs> that you have? My favorite Zig Ziglar story. All right. Yeah. So... So you have to know that uh, Zig tells a lot of stories, all right? He tells a lot of stories and they're all just amazing. But the story that probably impacted me uh, the most, uh, you know, is his prime the pump, you know, that you got to put something in to get something out. And if you'll Google Zig Ziglar prime the pump, you can see him uh, tell it. It's his most famous story. He used to travel around with the pump. But I'm going to tell you a less famous story, okay? Because okay. anyone can find prime the pump. So I'm going to tell you a story that I remember him telling that had a, just a profound impact on, on my life. And he literally, I remember sitting there and I remember him, I'm, I'm sitting there in front of him and he's talking about a, a rich, uh, or excuse me, he's talking about a farmer in Texas. Now this farmer in Texas, he's got a lot of land. So by all rights, you know, he was, he was better than most as a farmer, you know, but he was farming and he was making an honest living but wealthy, no way by any stretch. But all of a sudden someone came along and said, hey, would you mind if we check your land for oil? Because we, we've heard there's some oil in the area. And would you mind if we check your land? And he's like, sure, no problem, check it. He's like, you know what? We think we found some oil. And so we'd like to drill on your land and we'll give you 15% of the proceeds. If we find anything, will you let us drill? Yep, we'll let you drill. 
Well, back then they built oil rigs out of wood. It was called a derrick. And they built this well and they drilled down. And when they hit oil at this particular farmer's field, the pressure that came out of it when they hit it was so strong that it obliterated the derrick. Like it, it went into a million pieces and, and it took weeks just to, to cap the well. That well became known as Spindle Top. Five recognized companies on the, the New York Stock Exchange were born out of that single well. It produced more barrels of oil than any well in the history of, of oil uh, up to this time. I, I don't know if anybody's beat it. So here comes along, you know, so you can imagine this farmer went from owning some land to being a multi, 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 multi millionaire, if not billionaire, from just the royalties off this. So a reporter one day asked him, so what was it like to be uh, an instant millionaire? And he thought about it and he said, uh, I don't know what you mean. What do you mean? And he's like, well, you know, you're instant millionaire. And he said, you know, the way I look at it is that I became a millionaire 30 years ago, the day I signed the deed for this property. I just needed somebody to come along and show me where the riches were buried. Now, why is that story so impactful to me? Because that is exactly what we're talking about. I firmly believe that every person listening was born a millionaire. I believe that you were born with extraordinary gifts, with extraordinary talents to impact the world. What a shame if we die with those millions inside of us. What a shame if, if nobody ever shows us where those are buried. That's the job of a mentor. That's what a mentor does. A mentor comes on in your life and says, you are extraordinarily valuable. You are a multi millionaire to this world, to this society. And this is where your riches are buried. If we'll just drill over here, you could impact millions of people. So that story, that story about the oil well was really about mentorship. That story is about us being open to other people coming in and showing us where our riches are buried and then reaping the rewards for the rest of our life. So that's my favorite story. And that's why you know, it's so appropriate to tell that story as the last piece of our time together. Mark, I'm going to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out kevinmentor.com. Get the book, Mentor to Millions. Thanks, everyone. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.